What's up folks, 138 MMA here. We're gonna be breaking down Bellator 289 for y'all. We're gonna start with the early prelims all the way up to the main event of the evening. Um, I'm gonna start with actually the, the late edition fight that they just added, uh, Lucas Brennan versus Dre Miley. We're gonna go over that here in just a second actually because, well, it was just added and uh, I don't think it needs a full breakdown. So anyway, uh, but we're gonna break down this whole card. We're gonna go over some fights, uh, cover all the, all the ins and outs and all that good stuff. But if this is your first time to the channel, Welcome. We're glad to have you. 138 MMA welcomes you. So let me know in the comments if this is your first time here. If so, love it. If you end up liking this video at the end of the video, after you've enjoyed the content, go ahead and hit subscribe for me because you know what? Then you can stick around and you can enjoy more content. I will cover all the Bellator cards as well as the UFC cards. Um, if you have, if you are returning, if this is your, your, not your first time here, welcome the people that are new. And also, give me a like on this video, all right? Anyway, real quick. So we're going to cover that that uh, first fight. Lucas Brennan, 7-0, undefeated prospect. Pretty good um, pretty good prospect coming up. Uh, he was fighting, supposed to be fighting a couple weeks ago. Uh, I think it was the last Bellator card or whatever. Uh, I broke that one down. That fight didn't end up taking place. So they got him on this card against Dre Miley. Um, regional talent. So-so uh, yeah. competition. The dude's only got one eye, which is kind of surprising that he can still get a fight license because I remember Michael Bisbing having trouble with that um, once, you know, people figured out he only had one eye. But this guy's only got one eye and he's pretty open about it. So I don't know how he keeps getting a fight license. Uh, it's apparent that it obviously bothers him in fights because he doesn't see certain things coming. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't feel like it needs a whole breakdown. Lucas Brennan probably wins that fight. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know what you really need to worry about. Lucas Brennan's probably going to win. They got 7-0 and guy that they're hyping up, fighting a guy with one eye on short notice. I mean, come on. I, I don't want to be a jerk and pick on the guy with one eye, but let's let's be honest here. What do you expect? So anyway, that's the late edition. So I don't have a full breakdown on that fight, but we're going to get into the rest of, of of all the fights on the card, every single one of them. I'm going to cover all of them. I'm going to give you my full, full breakdown of each fight, and we'll do that right after this. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, 138 MMA proudly brings to you the hottest picks in the world. Breakdowns here. Uh, we have Denise Kielholtz coming in three and two in her last five fights, taking on the also three and two Elara Joanne. Uh, this fight here, pretty interesting one in the flyweight division. It's clear that Bellator uh, likes Denise Kielholtz, uh, so makes sense that they give her a matchup that seems kind of favorable for her. Um, so in this matchup here, we do have Joanne, who's not not a total scrub. She does have some decent striking. Her grappling's pretty good, and I do like her clinch work. She has some trips there that are you know, pretty good for the, for the level of competition she's had and things like that. So I don't, I don't think Joanne's terrible here, uh, but Denise Kilholtz is clearly the person that's getting the push here. She's, uh, she has very high level kickboxing. Her judo is high level as well. Uh, specifically what I like about her is her front kick. And I do think that's going to be something that she can use to, uh, to really control this fight because Joanne's going to want to get into the clinch. And if Joanne can get in that clinch, get that trip, she has a chance to start working her grappling really well. Um, I don't think that Kielholtz is lost in the clinch. Like I said, she does have a pretty high level of judo, um, and she does have some power in the hands as well. Kielholtz is going to be the better striker. Uh, the clinch work is going to be close, probably, because just different styles. Um, and in the grappling, I will say Joanne probably has a little bit better grappling in that. Actually, probably quite a bit better grappling. I just don't know that it's going to be able to get there. Um, she doesn't have any takedowns at range on the Joanne side, that is. Uh, so for me, Kielholtz is a clear pick here, but I don't know if I, I, don't know if I could convince myself to bet it. Um, but for me, Bellator wants her to win, should probably win. She's credentialed. Um, Kale Holtz is only, her two losses are to some of the highest level in Bellator. So, so it's, it's no shame there. So, uh, I'm going to take Kale Holtz. Let me know what you guys think. All right, real quick for bout order. I'm going off of what Tapology is currently saying. Um, I don't know why this fight is so early if Tapology has this correct on the lineup, but here we are. Uh, we've got Kyle Crutchmer taking on Jaleel Willis at the 170 pound welterweight division. Both guys were, were considered pretty high, um, you know, hyped up prospects by Bellator at one point. Um, Willis having a little bit of struggle in his last couple of fights, but I think it was just because he started to take on that, that better level of competition. Crutchmer also has a loss in his last five. This is kind of to see, from, by, from what I can tell, who's going to keep moving on as a, as a prospect and who's going to kind of just be a fill-in guy on the undercard from here on out in their career. That's kind of where I'm, where I'm seeing this fight going. Um, so in this one here... Uh, for Willis, he's 3-2 in his last 5, 4-1 and one for Kretschmer. I, I, I kind of mentioned that, I guess. Uh, the height and reach is pretty substantial in this one. For Willis, he is 5'11 with a 74 and a half inch reach over the 5'9", 68-inch reach of Kretschmer. 
Willis is going to be able to hit Crushman a lot quicker than Crushman is going to be able to hit Willis. Um, and I do think that Willis is going to be the more um, speedier with his strikes. It's not that Crushman can't strike. We'll get to the strike in a minute, actually. It, it, Crushman doesn't strike very well, but it's, it's, yeah. we'll explain that in a minute. Anyway, Julio Willis is going to be able to reach Crutchmer way before Crutchmer can reach Willis. And that's going to play a factor in this because, yes, Willis does have basic striking. But as I noted here, his athleticism makes it so he does have moments where his striking looks looks better than it should be on paper. Like textbook wise, it's all right. But his athleticism makes it look better than it is, especially with some like big kicks or, you know, throwing a throwing a long straight punch. Um, that looks better just because he's able to reach an opponent while he's still out of danger, if that makes sense. Um, both these guys are wrestlers. Uh, Willis does like to wrestle offensively. However, a big glaring weakness I noticed while I was watching some of his fights is he really struggles when he's the one that has been taken down. Uh, Willis does a decent takedown defense, but but if he is taken down, it he, he really struggles off his back. Um, and wrestlers often do if that's their, their primary... Uh, primary base martial art is wrestling because um, especially if it's like folk or freestyle wrestling where um, where your whole goal is to not be on your I guess all wrestling it's that but a lot of us in the states here if you are from the states if you're not well then here you go we grow we grow up doing uh, folk style wrestling in high school and the whole goal is not to be on your back so for guys like Willis who that's kind of what style they're using uh, if they don't learn and start doing jujitsu early enough things like that where being on your back is a big problem for them. Well, it seems like Willis is kind of in that area. So I could be wrong about his, his like when he started doing jujitsu or whatever, but he does struggle from his back. So there's the point there. And I'm going to kind of bring that home in a moment. On the other side, we have Crutchmer, who his striking is also very basic, but the threat of his wrestling really does kind of open up his strikes as the fight goes on. Because Crutchmer, in this fight, it might be different because he is so much sh shorter, but um, but Crutchmer does have some really solid wrestling I believe he wrestled at Oklahoma State, uh, which is a pretty good school for wrestling. I mean, you're, not, you're you know, anywhere anywhere in in uh, in kind of that Midwest or like slightly more East region of the United States, you're getting some some good wrestling. So for Crutchmer, I do think that his wrestling background is probably quite a bit higher than Willis, but Willis is not bad in the wrestling himself. Um, Crutchmer's a good minute winner. Dude just controls where the fight takes place, and for that, actually, is why I think he's going to win this fight. Both guys are going to have moments in this fight. I don't think Willis puts Crutchmer out with one shot. Maybe he does, but I don't think he does. Um, I do think Crutchmer is going to win more minutes in this fight. And I do think if he is able to land a takedown and get on top of Willis, I think that's it for that round. And Crutchmer is going to be able to bank the round. On the other side, if Willis banks a takedown, it's not necessarily over from there. Uh, I do think Crutchmer has the better wrestling and will be able to sweep a little bit more likely, um, get back to his feet, or just take top position. So... Although Willis can win rounds in this fight, I do think Crutchmer has more chances to do so. So I'm taking him here. Um, I'm not mega confident in it, but I, 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 you know, I'm better than, I'm more confident in this than a lot of the other fights I'm going to tell you on this one. So if you really need some parlay pieces on this card, because there's going to be a lot of blown up odds, I don't mind Crutchmer here, but it, it's not the safest bet and I probably won't play it. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. Let me know what you guys hey, think. You guys, now this is my first root beer fight of the night. Because we have way too many unknowns in this one. We have Patrick Downey coming in 1-0, spending 40-some-odd seconds in the cage in his entire career. Amateur pro, does no amateur fights that I could find. Just 1-0 as a pro over a guy that has never won a fight as a pro. Uh, guy has amateur wins, but 1-0 as a pro over a guy who's currently 0-4. One of the losses was to Downey. On the other side, we have Christian Eccles, who 2-2 two two is a pro. This is a tough one, guys. Uh, here's where we're at. So that two and two is bad competition. Um, dude has a loss to Treshawn Gore, and I don't think Treshawn Gore is very good. So there's that. Um, he has wins over guys that are just not good at all. So that two and two suspect. Um, one and zero is suspect. So I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and tell you. I'll give away the pick now. Downey should win, but if you're crazy if you're betting on this because we don't know anything about Downey. We have no idea how he's gonna do in an MMA fight past 40 some odd seconds against a guy that's never won a fight as a pro that's really tough he is six foot two as opposed to five ten on the other side high level wrestling background strong grappling at least he showed it in that 40 some odd seconds in that first fight against keys nelson or whatever um explosive powerful but like i said we don't know hardly anything he does a lot of grappling matches um totally different than mma obviously 
grappling is one thing, but when you're getting hit, it's a little bit different or a lot different. On the other side, Eccles does have decent Brazilian jiu-jitsu. But yeah, I mean, like I said, Downey should win, but I, the unknowns make me have a hard time wanting to put any money on this fight. If you're just a total degenerate and you're adding it to your crazy full fight parlay, then yeah, Downey's probably going to get the win, but I ain't touching it. I'm going to crack open a root beer and have a good time just ch kicking back and trying to figure out some of these unknowns. So let me know what you guys think. Next Let's up, go. Nice we have fight. Christina Katsikas coming in one and two in her only three fights, taking on Randy Field, three and one in her only four fights. Uh, this is a flyweight matchup. In this one here, um, I had a hard time breaking this one down because I have a hard time just not saying anything nice about someone. So I really tried here. Katsikas is strong. Didn't see much else. So, but she is strong. And actually that could play in her favor here because when you look at the Randy Field side, she does have decent striking, decent grappling, but she's been out-muscled in a couple of her fights. So when I was watching the, the three and one over here on the field side, she faced a couple of like um, kind of more muscular women that were able to just kind of body her up and throw her around a little bit. So it's not the worst matchup stylistically. Um, all skills point to a field getting the win. But like I said, that... Sometimes styles make fights, I guess. Um, but no, Katsikas, her striking is really bad. Um, her grappling, you would think she's good because you look at her topology and it's a picture of her in a gi. But I didn't see anything that really impressed me over anybody that is any good whatsoever. So I, I'm going to pick field, but I wouldn't put any money on it. I'm cracking open another root beer here, having a good time. I'm going to be getting, getting root beered out pretty quick on this card. Let's put it that way. Uh, so for me, Randy Field, let me know what you guys think. We're not going to waste any more time on this one. Let's go to the men's featherweight division. This one should be a pretty interesting fight, actually. We have Kevin Bame coming in 3-2 and two in his last five, taking on Kai Kamaka the third. Uh, for Kamaka, he's 1-3 and a draw in his last five fights. Not the best record. Yeah, he just hasn't lived up to expectations, but maybe this is his fight. So we're going to look at this one here. A um, couple of things. First off, Kevin Bame, 5'11", 70-inch reach. Quite a bit bigger than Kai Kamaka. Kamaka does have long arms. Um... Well, he has one inch longer arms than his than his, uh, than his height, so one inch longer ring, wingspan than height. But, uh, but I mean, realistically, you know, Kevin Bame should have a decent height and reach advantage there, so that's that's going to play in his factor. Something else, he's just going to be a bigger guy in general. Uh, Bame actually missed weight in his last fight, so, uh, you know, probably comes in a little heavy in, in this one too, who knows. Uh, but And he also got dominated in that last fight, so maybe there was something to that, but it was also against an undefeated prospect coming up. Either way, here's the thing. Kai Kamaka was a guy that came in to the UFC originally with some hype. Uh, people were like, you know, looking at him and say, ah, another one of them tough Hawaiians can just can go out there and bang, whatever. Not wrong entirely, but the wins weren't coming. So um, really lackluster performance in the UFC. He's trying to come back from that in Bellator so far. Yeah, so-so. Um, he does have a strong chin. It's kind of a thing. Um, Hawaiians are known to have a strong chin. Don't know why, but it's a thing. Um he also has a good, he has good striking. Uh, his punches are decent. Um, his kicks are really fast. So I do like that about Kai Kamaka. It's the takedown defense that he struggles with. Uh, and I didn't mention the lack of striking defense because he doesn't really have bad striking defense. It just gets worse as the fight goes on by a more significant margin than I would like to see. So not necessarily bad, but um, striking defense can be worse as the fight goes on. So something to note. On the BAME side... He's, he's just kind of that solid regional all-arounder. Probably the guy that's going to be headlining your local card that's like whatever your city is, fighting championships, you know what I mean? Like that that local card. He's probably the guy that when they get him on there, the whole city turns up, everybody's happy, whatever. This is our guy, it's our local boy, and they got him in there beating some bum. That's this guy. Uh, he's the best of your of your, your city's talent that hasn't transcended that city yet. Like that's that's what, it, what I see on the Kevin Bame side. Um, he's not bad at all. Don't get me wrong. He's not bad at all. His losses are to the, when he, you know, to the higher level guys, like when he steps up to that next level competition outside of his local regional scene, outside of, I guess, outside of the, the region, not just the city, but anyway, his wrestling is probably his best weapon, which stylistically is tough for Kamaka because he does get taken down. Um, he does have pretty good top pressure. So if he gets the takedown, Kamaka's going to have to work pretty hard to get up from that. Uh, but the thing that's going to play in Kamaka's favor Bame, I don't know why it's pronounced Bame. That doesn't look like Bame to me, but it's Bame. Uh, that's what every announcer said anyway. Uh, he does get dropped quite a bit. The thing is, he bounces back really quickly. Um, 
A guy I can equate this to is a Matt Schnell. Uh, unfortunately, if you just watched the uh, UFC card, Schnell did not bounce that quickly after a couple of times being knocked down by Nicolau. However, traditionally in Matt Schnell fights, he gets dropped, bounces right back up and starts firing again and doesn't look super rattled uh, as the time goes on. He has a quick recovery from getting knocked down. Bame is similar in that, in that regard. However, against a guy like Kamaka, you don't want to get knocked down very much because what guy hits really hard. Um, he also, and, and Kamaka can also bank rounds doing this. So this fight is a tough one for me because I can't trust Kamaka to get the win. Uh, he just doesn't show up. He, he, I don't know if he's gun shy. I don't know if the big lights and whatever get to him. Um, it seemed that way in the UFC. Bellator is, you know, a step down from the UFC, obviously, but it's still fairly popular. He just hasn't been able to really just get it done. Obviously, in his last five fights, he's got one win. It's not what you like to see about a guy that has the name value that Kamaka does. And I think it's kind of just kind of just something with his name. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an eye-catching name. On the BAME side, I don't know that I can trust him to take on somebody that has a decent level of experience at the higher level, such as Kamaka, uh, especially when he's going to get hit the way that he is. So this fight's going to go one of two ways. Uh, BAME's going to be able to bank rounds, get in the takedown, top pressure, winning it that way. Or Kamaka's going to be able to put on a striking clinic and drop BAME a bunch of times. Sure, maybe he gets taken down, but he's dropped BAME at least once in every round and gets the decision that way. I'm tempted to throw something on BAME just because the odds are big on Kamaka, and I don't know, I don't know why a guy that's won three and one draw in his last five fights is like a minus 400 favorite. That's a little bit weird. Um, but yeah, I just can't trust BAME to get the win either. So for me... For the excitement factor, I guess I'll pick Bame here. Not confident in it whatsoever. We're cracking open a couple of more root beers for this fight. I'm going to kick my feet up on the coffee table. I'm just going to watch this one. This one should be fireworks. Should be a fun time unless Bame just gets on him and lays on him. So that's possible too. But yeah, let me know what you guys think. Am I am I really counting out Kamaka too early? Am I overlooking something and, and giving Bame too much credit? I'd love to hear your opinion, especially on this fight. Because I had a really tough time with this one. So let me know. All Let's right, move we to the next one. One more that's a little bit tough to call, with uh, a little bit tougher than the old topology eyeball test gives you anyway. We have Jared Scoggins, 4-1 in his last five, taking on Cass Bell, 3-2 in his last five. This is the is a bantamweight matchup, and that's significant because Scoggins used to compete at flyweight. So here he is at bantamweight. Uh, it was a while ago, but there is that. Um, kind of notably, he actually has a win over Cody Durden, which has aged really well because... I mean, Cody Durden's doing the thing in the UFC right now, and he's doing pretty well. So so for Scoggins to have that win, not too bad. Shows that he can step up in competition. I do believe he only has 10, or I mean, two losses. He has 10 wins. Two losses in his entire career. So Scoggins, not bad. But when you originally, uh, when you look at this, if you just look at the topology, you see that all the Bellator fights for Bell are not, I mean, it's not been a ton, but he's got some Bellator fights under his belt. Um, you know, you'd be like, oh, Bell's got this one in the bag. Not so not so fast there. Let's let's talk about it a little bit. So for these guys, it's interesting with their height and reach. Uh, one guy is the taller guy with the shorter reach. So Cass Bell has a short wingspan because he has a five foot seven wingspan, which is the height of Jared Scoggins, um, who actually has a five eight and a half inch wingspan, uh, but five ten on the Cass Bell side. So he's taller, shorter arms. So I you know kind of an interesting one there. I wanted to note it. Don't know why, but I did. Um, with Scoggins, he does use a karate style pr uh, primarily. Moves in and out, kind of kind of like the Wonder Boy style. I know that not nearly as good as Wonder Boy. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Wonder Boy's the top level karate style, but hands down by his sides, keeping him moving. He's never you know never just stationary, hopping on his toes back and forth. Sticks that sidekick in, especially off that lead leg. Pops up real quick. That karate style, not not your taekwondo style with the high chamber and then brings it out. No, it's more like the leg comes like up like that, and you push off the back leg. So if you're familiar with the difference between the two, and I'm probably going to overdo this one here, the the, the karate style sidekick lands kind of, it's a little more sneaky, um, but it, you can't wind it up and really crank it in there as much as that taekwondo style, at least from what I've learned anyway. Don't, I'm not I'm not a black belt in either art, so bear with me. But the taekwondo style, that's the, that's the one you can really crank up, get that knee high, and just blast. But the karate style is going to be quick. And that's what uh, what Wonder Boy was able to do against Holland quite a bit, actually, in their in their fight just just the other day, uh, yesterday, as I'm recording this anyway. Uh, but yeah, so good karate there. I do like that the in and out movement. I do like that a lot. He is um, hard to get a hold of, hard to hit. Uh, on the other side, though, we have Caspell. 
Cash Bell, more of a wrestler. He has, he has good wrestling and he does have good grappling. And something I want you to do, if you're not familiar with Cash Bell, pull up a picture of him. Dude's got choking arms. And when I say choking arms, what do I mean? I say, I, these are like thin forearms that just slip right under that chin. Cash Bell's got him. He's, he's got a weird physique, really. Um, you know, I hope he's not offended by that, but he's got kind of a weird physique. Shorter, but yet skinnier arms. And I don't know. I mean, I guess if you're 5'10 and you make 135 pounds, you, you probably have skinny arms. So, so anyway... Uh, yeah, dude's got choking arms. So if you can get a hold of you on the ground, slip one right under your chin, no problem. You know what I mean? Um, he does put on a good pace. I do I do like that about Bell. Um, and something that, that something that's really odd, and I'd wonder, I'd, I'd really wonder how this is going to work out is the movement. So you've got traditional karate style movement from Scoggins, as I mentioned. But you have this really awkward like movement and striking out of Bell, where you can tell that he's a wrestler trying to strike from like his wrestling movements. Um but he has okay power when he hits you. And I think it's a lot of it's because you don't expect it. Because uh, the shot that hits you and you don't see it coming, that's the one that hurts most or the one that kind of rattles you the most because we didn't see it coming. So um, so it seems to work for him, like I mentioned here. But, but yeah, no, Bell, is uh, he's got a weird weird style on the feet. <sighs> to make a pick, I'm going to take Bell. Not make it confident in it, though, because I do, I do favor wrestlers over strikers uh, typically. Um, something that proves that, at least in my estimation is you got i'm gonna bring up wonder boy again well the, he's the highest level karate fighter to ever make it to mma i would say dude gets taken down by wrestlers and controlled and that's what happens i think i don't think cas bell is of the level of wrestling of like a Bilal muhammad or anything like that but cas bell's got good wrestling scoggins doesn't have the karate of wonder boy thompson so you know this is just basically the 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 scaled down version of that to put it simply anyway obviously there's a lot more variables but to put it simply so for me, I think Cass Bell gets it done. Not as confident as I should be in this one, but um, but I do think Cass Bell gets it done. There is a world where Scoggins is able to stuff those takedowns. He did it against Cody Durden, and that's the thing. Although that was at a different weight class, he did it against Cody Durden, who also has pretty darn good wrestling. Uh, so for me, that is kind of a red flag uh, for, for putting any money on Bell. I haven't decided yet, but I, I'm going to take Bell. Let me know what you guys think. If you guys are confident one way or the other, I'd love to hear it. Scoggins does have a couple paths to victory here that are pretty clear, especially with that sidekick. Snaps one up right to the chin when uh, Bell's got his hands down low looking for the takedown. That could be game over. But, you know, let me know what you guys think. I will see you in the next one of those topology trickeries here. Oh, uh, yeah. Mark uh, Leminger. Leminger? I think that's how you say that. Taking on Michael Lombardo. 170 is the weight division, so welterweight here. Uh, for Lombardo, he's 3 1 and 1 no contest in his last five fights. 1 and 4 on the Leminger side. Uh, in this one here, the one and four, you look at that and you go, that's terrible. But he's been fighting pretty good level competition. So uh, he's fought like Neiman Gracie as of recent. Then he got knocked out by Neiman Gracie, which that's not a good look because Neiman Gracie can't really strike super well. But we're going to get into that. But either way, he's fought some pretty darn good level competition recently. So there is that. Um, Lombardo, on the other hand, he's kind of fighting the more up and comers still kind of getting there. But uh, Leminger's kind of bouncing back from getting up, getting pushed up a little bit too high, too fast. So that's kind of where the discrepancy is there. So let's kind of get into their skills and where I think this fight's going to go. So first things first, let's talk about Lombardo first. Lombardo has really good box. Well, not really good. He has pretty good boxing for his level that he's at currently. He has good boxing. He does work his jab really well. I wish he would throw a little bit more in combination. Ones and twos, three punches at most. A lot of the time, I would love to see him just lay on some volume. But he doesn't really do that too well, but he does work that jab at, at a, at a way, in a way that I do think that is going to favor him against a guy like Leminger in this matchup, at least. He works that jab really well. The problem is he has basic level takedown defense. It's not bad, but he can be taken down. Um, he can be taken down and, con and not controlled, but he can take, be taken down repeatedly. The thing is, though, from his back, he never accepts bottom position. He's working immediately when you take him down. So... How many times can you take this guy down? Because if you take him down, and you will have to work for it. He doesn't just give it to you. Uh, you will have to work a little bit for it. Um, but it's not it's not top-level takedown defense. But he never accepts that position. He starts working off his back immediately. And I'm not talking about just going for, like, submissions and strikes off his back. He does that really well, and I like that he mixes the two together. Throws the elbows, you know, punches a little bit. But he also is looking for the submissions. But he also has some really good, or not really good, but he has pretty good sweeps. He can sweep you and take the top position himself and either just get back up and start working back his boxing or land some ground and pound, you know, work something from the top there. He's not bad on the ground. And when he does get taken down, he's it's not a lost cause for him. So I do, I do like that on the Lombardo side. 
On the other side, Leminger. I like his offense, and I don't like his defense. I'm just going to put it plain and right out there for you. His offensive wrestling is good. His defensive wrestling is not good. He can get taken down, no problem. He can take people down, no problem. Uh, his defensive striking is, uh, is, is terrible, while his offensive striking is pretty good. He throws with some decent power in the hands. He does let him kind of get low, though, and that's a problem for, for Leminger, Leminger here. He does let his hands get a little bit low when he's throwing these big shots. And against the guy with the boxing of Lombardo, that could be a problem for him. Um, in this matchup, for me to make a pick, I'm going to say Lombardo probably gets the win. It's another one where I'm not mega confident, but I do feel better in this one than, than a couple of the others where I've been really on the fence. So I'm going to take Lombardo. If you guys think Lemminger's getting kind of the raw end of the deal, let me know. I just think the knockout by, by Neiman Gracie kind of makes me think that Lombardo is going to be able to really piece him up on the feet. Um, and I don't think he's going to get the chance to work his wrestling enough to secure a victory with the activeness of Lombardo from his back. So that's the way I see it going. Lombardo, he's the pick. Let me know what you guys think. Next oh, matchup is in the featherweight division. And I think this one has the potential of being the fight of the night. We have Cody Law coming in 4-1 and one in his last five fights, taking on Chris Lencioni, 4-1 and one in his last five. Now, for me, this fight is really exciting. And at first, I didn't think it would be. Uh, Bellator was really pushing Cody Law hard, but he did get a loss. And that kind of made them kind of get the whole, well, is he what we think he is or is he not? And now they're going to test him with Chris Lencioni, see if he beats that test. If he does, he'll probably go right back to getting that push. And if not, well, guess what? Chris Lencioni just got a big win on his record. So here's what we've got. So we've got uh, Cody Law. He is the shorter with the uh, with the less reach fighter here. 5'9", 68.5-inch reach against the 5'10", 71-inch reach of Lencioni. This fight is interesting because both guys are good grapplers. So uh, let's we'll start with Cody Law. He, has, he does have really good wrestling, uh, but the problem is he does struggle off his back. So offensively wrestling, solid. But if he does get taken down, kind of like we mentioned in an earlier video, that those guys that grow up doing that folk style wrestling, they don't like being on their back, rightfully so. That's how you lose in a wrestling match. Well, he doesn't want to be off on his back, and he kind of struggles when he's there. It's an unfamiliar position for him. Uh, he does have decent striking. Doesn't seem to have a ton of power, but I I don't I didn't make a note of it because I'm not that confident in that statement. But he doesn't seem to have a ton of power. Does have good volume. Something that's a problem for him, specifically in this matchup, is he can get backed up. He'll he'll come back to going forward. But he will back up as he's fighting, and I don't know why he does it, because uh, his wrestling is better when he's going forward, and his striking is better when he's going forward. But sometimes he will let himself start to get backed up, and I've seen it as his career has gone on to become more and more. So on the Lencioni side, obviously he's going to have the height and reach advantage. So if he's able to start backing up Law, Law's not going to be able to get to cross that distance so well. And he's got a good chin. The guy will move forward, too, because... And he's got a good chin. What's he afraid of? Especially against a guy that I'm not sure on his power. Uh, so Lencioni does have that kind of kind of wrinkle there in his game. He does have really good grappling as well. Can work well against the cage. Um, he, and sometimes he's fishing for takedowns there, but a lot of times he's getting you up against the cage and just working you. Um, and I do like that out of him because he kind of makes it dirty, makes it nasty. If he starts getting hit from when you're up against the cage there, it's fine by him. He's got a good chin, and he's just going to keep working you over, winning those minutes landing just as many strikes as well. When he does get on top of you, that top pressure is good, uh, and the ground and pound is pretty nice. I, I do like I do like Lencioni's ground and pound. So in this one here, it's an uh, interesting stylistic matchup for me. Offensively, Cody Law does have good wrestling, like I said. The problem is he seems to prefer to strike, and I don't know why because it's not his best attribute, and I think he kind of fell in love with his hands when he was beating up tomato cans because Bellator does that for you. They start giving you a couple of tomato cans, get you thinking you're this all-star striker when you when your bread and butter is your wrestling. And then all of a sudden you say, you know what? I'm a, I'm a good striker. And really you're not. You're just better than tomato cans. So I think that's what happened to Cody Law. I could be wrong, but that's what I think happened to Cody Law. Lencioni, he's fought a lot better competition overall. Um, won some, lost some. Obviously he's 4-1 in his last five, so he's not losing everything. And with a chin like he's got, I don't think that he's going to have to worry about Cody Law striking too much. So unless Law starts grappling offensively early in this fight... Lencioni's going to bank some rounds, and I do think that if Lencioni gets on top of Law, Law's going to be in trouble, because like I said, he doesn't work well off his back, um, and, and Lencioni is nasty on the top. So for me, I'm kind of, I'm pretty sure Lencioni's an underdog. I haven't really looked at the odds for this. They're not really out on any sports book yet, so you just got the reference on Best Fight Odds, and I didn't look into it too much. Look it up yourself, bestfightodds.com. There you go. You can, you can pull it up right next to this video in another tab. All, no problem. Uh, but Lencioni... Yeah, if he's a big enough underdog, I'd be 
convinced to throw a half unit on that without too much trouble. Uh, I just, I'm just not sold on Cody Law yet. Uh, that, that loss he does have on his on his record, I believe he's like six and one overall. That loss he does have on his record, he didn't look too good in it. And uh, for me, Lencioni has looked. He, he's just just the right type of fighter to beat a guy like Cody Law. So for me, I'm taking Lencioni here. If the odds are wide, I'm taking. I'm gonna, I might put a half unit on that. I uh, might suggest that even. Uh, but but if they're close, I'd probably just sit back and watch this one. So let me know what you guys think. If you think Cody Law is just gonna dog walk him here, that's possible. Uh, let me know. Cody Law did have some pretty darn good wins coming up to it. They were just against lesser competition. So that's where I'm at. I'll see you guys on the next one. In fight. the middleweight division, we have Dalton Rasta taking on Anthony Adams. For Rasta, he's an undefeated prospect at 7-0, 5-0 in his last five, obviously. 3-2 and two on the Adams side. <clears throat> in this matchup, there is a bit of a height and reach advantage on the Adams side. He is 6'1 with a 76-inch reach, as opposed to the 6'74 inch reach of Rasta. So this matchup here. Anthony Adams, you may recognize that name for being on Dana White's Contender Series twice, losing both times. Um, not because his striking is poor, because his striking is very good, but he doesn't really, he doesn't do anything if you take him down. He'll just give up minutes, and that's unfortunate because his striking is very good. Uh, for Adams, <clears throat> his Muay Thai, very, very solid. I'm pretty sure he's been a champion in some sort of Muay Thai uh, organization somewhere. Don't quote me on that. I don't really watch a lot of Muay Thai, just Muay Thai. I'm an MMA guy. That's what I watch. I don't watch the other stuff. Shoot me if you need to. Either way, uh, he's a Muay Thai guy. He's very good at it, though, and he works it into his MMA. He's explosive. He has that dynamic striking, really good kicks. You know, he can go into the clinch that circles back to that Muay Thai. He has a good Thai clinch as opposed to the wrestling-style clinch that you get from the wrestlers. Um, but the problem is he can be taken down and controlled, and that's what happens to him. Um, he, uh, If you remember his Impica Sanganai fight on the Contender Series, Adam was winning that fight. With his striking, he's clearly he was clearly the better striker. But Kasagan, I realized, oh, this guy can just let me take him down, and he's not going to do anything if I take him down, and I'm going to be able to win the fight here. So Kasagan, I was able to beat Anthony Adams on the Contender Series, because, mostly because he doesn't do anything when he is taken down, and you actually control him and lose minutes, and then he'll try to strike when the round the next round starts. So that's the problem there. On the other side, we have a guy who's clearly going to be outclassed in the striking. He does have decent striking because he throws with a lot of power. And his shots look clean, but the problem is he just throws a lot of single shots, maybe a one-two, you know, just that 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 jab and that cross or whatever. He throws real just powerful single shots here and there. And that's fine for a lot of fights uh, as you're coming up. It's going to be tough against a guy with this level of striking. So for, for Rasta, that's going to be a, an area where he's probably going to struggle. But he's a very strong guy, and his wrestling is decent. So if he can get a hold of Adams... I will say that he probably has better wrestling than Kasang and I. I don't think that's a crazy thing to state. So if he can get a hold of Adams and understand early on that Adams is not going to be able to do a lot in the resistance of the wrestling, then yeah, Ross is going to win this fight. But if Ross decides to stand and trade with him this whole fight, he's probably going to lose this fight to a guy that has a better height and reach, has a way better striking skill set, and can also work well in the clinch if it does get there. So, so for me... The pick is going to be Rasta. I just hope he's not dumb and doesn't, and I hope he doesn't just try to make this a striking match. Rasta's still early in his career, obviously seven and zero. He hasn't he hasn't beaten a lot of like world beaters or anything. I believe he has a couple of decent wins over some some fair level guys. Uh, nothing crazy, but um, but yeah, he's he's pretty good from what I can tell. But he hasn't been tested against a guy with the striking of Adams, so it's hard to really say. And he's probably going to be a massive favorite in this one. I don't know what the odds are at all, actually. But if Rust is a massive favorite, I won't play it. Odds are close. Maybe I'll throw him in a parlay or something. Um, I do like Rasta. I think he gets the win. Adams is just, he's just too one-dimensional to win at the highest level or even at the second highest level, which is Bellator. Let me know what you guys think. Anthony Adams is probably the more exciting, explosive striker, but that's not going to always get him to win. And that's what's happened so far in his career. So... I'll see you guys in the next video. I'd love to hear your feedback. Just look at the pluses and minuses on the board. You're going to think this is a cakewalk, but I don't think that that holds true. There's just some, just uh, more things to highlight on one side, but I don't think it's going to matter as much as that looks. So let me break this down for you. We've got Magomed Magomedov, four and one in his last five, taking on Patchy Mix, four and one in his last five. Now this is the final for the Grand Prix or whatever for the, uh, for the 135 pound Bantamweight division. Both guys, like I said, four and one in their last five. Uh, they are they are both very high level grapplers, so we're gonna see probably a grappling fight. But who knows? Sometimes when you get that, you start end up getting a striking match, and that will change things drastically. In this one, Patchy Mix is five foot eleven with a seventy one and a half inch reach, which is actually pretty ridiculous for the bantamweight division. 
he's that's huge. I don't know if you realize that. The guy's 135 pounds come weigh-ins, and he's 5'11 with a 71 and a half inch reach. Magomedov is more. Magomedov is not a small bantamweight because five seven on the on the decent side of bantamweight, 69 inch reach. Okay, that's like a five nine inch reach. So that's not bad. But Patchy Mix is huge. So um, kind of like a Sean O'Malley style huge, uh, getting five foot eleven there. So or or a Corey Sandhagen for example. That's what you get on the UFC comparison anyway. Uh, so in this one though, both guys, good wrestlers, good good grapplers. Uh, very high level grappling on the patchy mix side. His grappling is relentless with the transitions going from submission to submission to submission seamlessly. He does have the wrestling to get the fight to the mat. Uh, that's kind of similar on the other side. So for Megamedov, his very high level grappling as well. His wrestling, high level, expertly timed entries on his takedowns. And he also can chain those takedowns together better than a lot of the Bantamweights, probably better than any Bantamweight in Bellator. He chains his takedowns together very well. Um, actually 100% better than any band weight in Bellator. Anyway, he also has a good cage push. That's something that, uh, something that gets kind of overlooked a lot when you're thinking about a fight. The cage push is a real thing that you need to take, take a lot of, um, take a lot of account for because how many fights do you see end up where two guys are up against the cage? Well, the guy who's holding the other one against the cage is winning the minutes. And you know, it's, it might be boring at times when that happens, but if it's need, if it needs to be done, Magomedov is probably going to be able to get the, be the one to get it done. My goodness, I'm tongue tied. All uh, right, so Magomedov, he's the better minute winner, like I was saying. Something else on the feet, I don't think Magomedov is lost because his kicks are very nice. Uh, he does, he doesn't have so much in the boxing, but his kicks are solid. On the other side, I didn't write it up there, but Patchy Mix probably has the better hands. So, with that extra reach, he might be able to implement some striking there. If this does end up becoming the classic grappler versus grappler matchup where they end up having a striking match, this is going to be close uh, because I don't know what we go off of as far as how that's going to play out. You can't really go off the Patchy Mix one on Shaletta fight for that because by the time it became a striking match, Patchy Mix had gassed. So I put that he has questionable cardio here, but... This fight here, I don't, I don't know if it's going to be the same. Um, he gassed himself out grappling and wearing on on Juan Archuleta. The problem is uh, this because when when he started losing because he was tired was in the striking with Archuleta. Now, do I think Magomedov is going to be able to piece him up in the striking? Not really. I think in the, if the, in the striking department, I'd give it slightly on the patchy mix side. Not a lot, but slightly. So I don't really know how bad his cardio is going to be come that, because he didn't gas out until like the end of the third round. So it's not like it's terrible. But the other news is, Pagamedov doesn't have any cardio issues whatsoever. That guy can go forever. He doesn't ever look tired, just keeps going. So if it does come down to cardio, I think Magomedov gets that done. Um, I do believe this is a five round fight. You might want to double check that. I could be lying to you, but I'm pretty sure this is a five round fight uh, because it is the, the Grand Prix finale. So with that said, the cardio does favor Magomedov. Even if it does, even if even if we can't really say that the it's going to be a similar style to the Archuleta fight, I've never seen Magomedov get tired, so the cardio will still fade him. With the grappling and strike or the grappling and wrestling and things like that, Patchy Mix is slicker when it comes to like going for his 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 submissions and transitions on the ground. But Magomedov has better control and probably wins wins more minutes and can mix in the ground and pound really well as well. Both guys mix in the ground and pound well, uh, so. It's hard to say who wins the grappling early on. As the fight drags, I'm going to say Magomedov probably gets it. For that simple reason, I'm going to pick Magomedov here. But because this fight should be a very interesting fight, very fun fight to watch, I'm cracking open a couple more root beers. I'm getting crazy on my root beers, this, this, this Bellator card. Usually a Bellator card, you have a bunch of guys you can say, let's parlay this eight people together and we're going to have an easy win. But th this one's not quite this, that way. So um, for me, I'm gonna lean Magomedov. I'll probably just kick back and watch this one. I don't feel as I don't feel like this is one that I would put. I'm not I'm not feeling super good about this one. Patchy Mix is a tough guy to handle. So for me, I lean Magomedov. If it ends up being a striking match, Patchy Mix has a real path to victory here. He does have the reach and the height and something I've said it in other videos before. But for those of you that are new to the channel, I'm gonna break it down real quick. When you're fighting against a guy taller than you, practices if you have a heavy bag or like even just in the air. When you're fighting a guy taller than you, you're not just going against their reach. Because yes, they can reach you even if you're if you're if the reach is different or whatever. But the height. Try go to a punching bag and try punching straight ahead. Okay, your shoulder is equal with your hand at extension. Try punching straight ahead. Do that for a while. See how long you, before you get tired. 
wait till you're recovered, you're not sore anymore, whatever. Then try doing that as if you're punching up however many inches it's gonna be. In this instance, it's four. So from straight ahead, mark four inches up on the bag and punch up for those four inches or whatever to try to hit the, uh, the taller fighter. Because even when you're punching a guy that's the same height as you, their head's just a little higher. So you're going up a little bit. But we're, for the sake of argument's sake here, we're going to say we're just going to go four inches up. The level of difficulty to punch just four inches higher is massive. And you're going to fatigue your shoulders a lot faster. I know that seems silly. I know it does. But it's the truth. I can tell you from experience. I know that is true. Punching higher wears your shoulders out much faster than punching straight ahead. So in the striking department, I'm giving that one to Patchy Mix. I think Magomedov gets it done not mega confident. Let me know what you think. If you've got one of these guys as a lock, I would love to hear it, but let's get into the co-main event. We got a couple of title fights on this card, and that's what we're going to talk about next. Bellator Women's Flyweight Championship on the line in this next matchup, and something tells me that a lot of you guys are going to disagree with me on this one, so I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback in the comments. But before we go any further, if you've made it this far in the video and you haven't yet subscribed, what are you doing? Clearly you like this content, so subscribe so you can see it next time it comes out. I'm going to have more for the next Bellator card. Going to have more for the next UFC card. So subscribe so you can see it. I'm trying to help you help yourself. Also, if you've enjoyed this video so far, hit like. And if you're watching it still, since you've, if you've started at the beginning and you're still watching this video, you probably like it. Otherwise, you wouldn't still be here. You'd go on to some other guy that's doing something, reading off topology. So what we've got is a Bellator Women's Flyweight Championship, and we're going to get into it. Here we go. Liz Carmouche coming in 4-1 uh, and one in her last five fights, taking on Juliana Velasquez, 4-1 and one in her last five. This is weird because both ladies, I put a negative mark by their age, 38 and 36. The difference is Liz Carmouche has a lot more experience than Velasquez. Velasquez, if you didn't know she was 36, you'd think, oh, she's an up-and-comer. She's got like, what, 13, 14 fights, something like that. She's 36 already, though. She is talented, but she's been doing other things. She hasn't been doing MMA for that long. So that's where that comes from. I'm going to start with, with Velasquez here. The last fight between these two was a bit controversial. Um... I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It was a weird one. I don't know what to say about that fight. So we're just going to leave it at that. It was a weird one. Let's break down this fight though, because that's what we're here to do. In this matchup, Velasquez does have a really good cage push. I think that's where she can win a lot of her fights. Getting an opponent up against a cage, working them over, using, using the takedowns from there if she needs to. Um, she does have solid takedown defense in her own right. So in, if the roles are reversed, she can fight that off. Here's the thing though about Velasquez. Her grappling is only really good when she's on top. When she gets to the, when she's on the bottom, it's just not there. And I think that comes down to just kind of where she like what her her credentials are outside of MMA. She doesn't spend a lot of time on the bottom. So um, because I believe she comes from kind of like a judo background. I believe it's a judo background. I could be wrong about that. I believe she comes from a judo background. I watched her MMA fights. I didn't look up any of her judo or what have you, but. Based on the way she fights, it looks like that. So she does have good grappling when she's on top in her MMA fights, but when she's on the bottom, it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't flow quite as well. And that might also have something to do with the, the competition that she's fought that has been able to get top position on her. Uh, in this also, she does have powerful striking. It's just kind of basic. It's not clean. It's not crisp. Um, I, don't, I definitely think the striking advantage goes on the Carmouche side here. Although she's 38 years old, so you have to take that into account. That is getting up there for especially a women's flyweight division fight. But I don't know. The, the ladies have been going later in their career in MMA lately. And I they haven't been showing a big decline like the men do. Like a male 125er at 38 years old is totally washed up. But Liz Carmouche, Juliana Velasquez, they're not totally washed up at this point in their career. And it's kind of strange to me. So I don't know. I guess... Men die earlier than women, so maybe we just we also just hit our peak earlier and start crashing. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. Anyway, striking, definitely on the Carmouche side. She does have decent striking. And by decent, I mean it's not her best asset, but it's good enough. Um, she does keep her hands up, uh, has a good solid defense there, but she can counter strike. And that's not something that you see in a lot of um, – that's not something you see from a lot of fighters that their primary art isn't striking. She's she's definitely more jujitsu heavy. Um, as, as you see there, she is a strong Brazilian jiu-jitsu player. Uh, but her, her striking defense with the counters is actually pretty solid. And you can see that in some of her fights that, you know, people will look at her and say, okay, she's a, she's a grappler. Yes, she is, but the striking shouldn't be overlooked. And in this matchup, it's a strong advantage for her. 
Um, she also is a, she's good at grappling, obviously. Um, she has good takedowns. That's something that we're going to see because can the takedowns of Carmouche get Velasquez? I think they can, but who knows? And she's a very strong fighter. She's one of the strongest fighters I've seen in the women's 125 pound division. Something I want to point out. She has fought the best of the best at the women's flyweight, bantamweight, does not matter. She's fought the best of the best in women's MMA at this point in her career. She has two fights with Valentina Shevchenko, who is the current UFC women's flyweight champion, if you aren't aware. And guess what? She didn't lose both of those. She beat Shevchenko, although it was like 2010, but she has a win over Shevchenko. That is crazy because Shevchenko beats most people, obviously. She's the champion. She's been champion for a while. She had a... She probably had the most success against Ronda Rousey early on in, their, in her career when Rousey was just steamrolling everyone. Carmouche had pretty good success in that matchup given the fact that Rousey was steamrolling everybody. So for that said, Carmouche has fought pretty much everybody. She's obviously towards the end of her career, but she still seems to be having success. In the last matchup, obviously she's the champion, so there you go. That, that's how that went. I like Carmouche here. Not a ton, but I like Carmouche. I bet her last time. Um, I I think Carmouche gets this done. I just don't think Velasquez is quite ready for this level of competition. Um, Velasquez does have a path to victory here. Obviously, she's powerful, so there's that too. But if she can get this fight up against the cage and really work her style there, I think Velasquez has a really good path to victory from that spot. Everywhere else, I do think Carmouche has just a slight edge. It's against the cage work in her game that Velasquez has the biggest advantage and I don't see it staying there because like I said Carmouche is very strong she has good takedowns of her own and her striking is pretty good so for me I'm taking Carmouche I know a lot of you are going to be taking Velasquez and I'd love to hear about it so let me know in the comments and let's get into our main event of the evening next up we next. have the bantamweight championship the Bellator men's bantamweight championship Rafion Stotts 5-0 in his last five obviously is the champion here Coming against Danny Sabatello, 5-0 in his last five fights. This one's really interesting to me because both guys are more or less wrestlers. So uh, for Danny Sabatello, he's the challenger here. He is 5'10 with a 69 and a half inch reach. So he is the taller fighter, but does have the shorter reach. On the other side, we have Rafion Stotts, who's 5'7 with a 72 and a half inch reach. So quite a bit shorter, three inches shorter, but quite a bit in the reach advantage here. And we're going to cover that here in a moment. So... Uh, on the next part that I want to cover here is the wrestling of Sabatello. He has really good wrestling. He has good chain wrestling. He's really good in the scrambles. The problem is he doesn't do much damage with his wrestling. He will control you. He'll take you down. Kind of a lay and pray. Kind of just, you know, doesn't really do much. He's very position over submission. Very much just control. Control, control, control. And that's great. But he doesn't do a lot of damage. And... If the ref's going to be very forgiving and just let you lay and lay and pray, Danny Sabatello is going to have success being able to do that in most fights. However, if the ref keeps standing it up, well, if the other guy can start landing some shots on you, re uh, judges have been giving more to the damaging striker over the wrestler that doesn't do damage with the wrestling. Now, if you do damage with the wrestling, that's different, but that's how it's been. Uh, he lacks striking. He doesn't really strike much at all. Whether uh, Who knows? Maybe he's good at it, but he just doesn't do it. Um, and when he does, it's very, very like, I'm just doing this to set up the wrestling. So there's that. Rafion Stotts, on the other hand, deceptive range. And I say that because he's five foot seven and he has a wingspan of over six foot, six foot and a half inch. Um, so over six foot on the reach, he has deceptive range. And before I cover his wrestling, let's cover his striking. He has pretty solid striking with decent power. And for a guy at Bantamweight with like, a, like I said, over a six foot reach, against a guy that can't really strike very well, that's going to come in handy for him because he also has good wrestling. Uh, he wrestled at a high level. He does have really good defensive wrestling specifically. And I think in this matchup, that's going to play a big role. He does sprawl well, so he can stuff the takedown originally. But he also sweeps well from his back. So if he does get taken down, he can flip that thing over and take top position. Here's the thing. I don't think this is going to be that close. I think Rafion Stotts is far better than Sabatello. Sabatello is a good fighter. Don't get me wrong. I think he's talented. I think he's going to go places, but I think he just completely lacks a striking game. And I think that makes it makes him obviously one dimensional. And when you're fighting for titles, you can't be that one dimensional unless you are just so gosh darn good at what you do that nobody can stop you. And I don't think that's the case for Sabatello against a guy like Rafion Stotts, who's also a very high level wrestler in his own right. So for me, I'm pretty confident Rafion Stotts here. I don't know what the line is right now, but if it's even playable, I would suggest playing it. I think Stotts gets this one done. 
He's going to be way better in the striking. The wrestling, it'll probably be close, but I would even say Stotts might be the better wrestler, um, especially with the ability to use his long arms to, you know, reach through position, to, you know, use the sweeps off his back and get on top, and maybe even do damage while he is on top with the wrestling. So for me, Stotts is a clear pick here. If you've enjoyed this video, hit like for me, subscribe to the channel, Check out some of my other videos. I know a lot of them aren't really relevant after the fights are over, but, you know, I've got my top five favorite fighters video. I've got the art of the pick video, um, some stuff that you that might be interested in. Anyway, that's what I've got. I'll see you guys in the UFC breakdown that's coming out soon, tomorrow, Monday or Tuesday. So see you there. Let's get into whatever we're going to do next.